Chapter 8 Amy to the Rescue Pearl, what is the matter with you? This question was asked sharply by Mrs. Rawlinson as she scrutinized her cousin's face with her quick eyes. Matter? Oh, nothing, answered Pearl, flushing under the examination. Nonsense, my dear. Haven't I known you from babyhood? And for you to sit there and tell me that you are in your usual equable state of mind is simply ridiculous. I haven't seen you for a week, not since the cherry party. You have not condescended to come to my house, and each time I have come to yours, I have been told that you were out, and what is more, have had the door calmly shut in my face by that extremely impertinent boy of yours. Amy tells me she has met with the same fate. May I ask the reason of this strange behaviour? Certainly, replied Pearl calmly. You may ask what you like, but I don't fancy the reply will enlighten you much. I was busy saying my prayers. Mrs. Rawlinson stared, as well she might, at this unexpected answer to her question. Pearl laughed nervously at the expression on her cousin's face. Oh, you need have no fear for the state of my brain, she replied. I have finished now. I prayed for the last time yesterday evening. Pearl, replied Mrs. Rawlinson gravely, as she rose and began fastening her cloak. I don't understand you in this flippant mood. I have never known you to joke about sacred subjects before, and I can't imagine what possesses you now. Your looks, too, have changed. You seem to have grown quite thin in a week. Your eyes are shining, and your cheeks have two red spots on them. What is the meaning of all this? Pearl looked impatiently at the clock, an action which, as she intended, was not lost on her cousin. You are going out, she said. Well, goodbye. We shall meet at the Prime Minister's ball tonight, I suppose, and then, dearest, you will have plenty of time, as you do not dance, to tell me what is troubling you. Pearl gave a sigh of relief as the door closed behind Mrs. Rawlinson. Oh, these relations, she ejaculated. Much as we may love and appreciate them on ordinary occasions, how utterly wearisome and dethrope they prove themselves at certain moments of one's existence. Once more she glanced at the clock, noticing that the hands pointed to half past five. Three hours and a half more, she sighed, as for the twentieth time that day she drew from her pocket Martin Wirth's passionate reply to her summons. How shall I ever get through them? At a quarter to nine that evening, just as Amy Mendovi was rising from the table, with the intention of dressing for one of the events of the spring, the Prime Minister's ball, a note from Mrs. Nugent, was put into her hands. Dearest Amy, it ran, as you love me, come to me immediately on receipt of this line. I am in great trouble and in dire need of you. Give up the ball for my sake and come to me, I implore you. Yours, Pearl. P.S. I'm not ill. Amy's face clouded. What? Give up the ball? This ball on which she had so greatly reckoned for the sole reason that she knew Sir Ralph would be present? She had long ago decided in her own mind that this was to be the occasion on which might be expressed, without loss of self-respect, a reasonable amount of contrition and regret. There were moments when Amy flattered herself that she knew her power well enough to be fairly certain that she had only to offer the olive branch to see it promptly accepted. And yet again, at other times, she felt considerable doubt as to advances being well received. 
Sir Ralph's conduct of late had certainly not held up much promise of success. She had not seen him since the garden party, and her vanity suffered more than one moon as the disagreeable conviction slowly dawned upon her that he was persistently keeping out of her way. From all sides, she heard of his devoted attendance upon Lady Martinworth. Though Amy had more than once seen this lady, she did not know her. In moments of depression, therefore, she found herself picturing her rival as the owner, if not of beauty, of much fascination and every charm, coupled with those powerful weapons, a clever woman's designing and seductive wiles. Lady Martinworth would have been the first to have felt intense amusement at such gifted and extremely unlikely traits of character being attributed to her. Poor Amy was therefore somewhat perplexed and annoyed, and at times she felt extremely sorry for herself. She concluded that she had already been more than amply punished for those few bars played so thoughtlessly on the piano, and sometimes she declared to herself that it was imperative necessity to end the present unsettled situation. These last few weeks of uncertainty had taught her, more than all the previous months put together, how true and sincere was her love for Ralph Nicholson. She could only pray now that her own foolish conduct had not forever put it out of her power to prove this fact to him. The ball, she knew, would settle matters one way or the other. And it was with a feverish anxiety, very unlike the usual indifferent insouciant Amy, that she awaited the evening's event. And now the receipt of this frantic little note upset all her calculations, destroying at one blow all her brilliant castles in the air. She hesitated. Pearl herself wrote she was not ill. What reason strong enough could therefore exist to cause Amy to relinquish this entertainment, an entertainment where so much that was momentous might occur? Her absence from the ball would cause Sir Ralph to doubtlessly put a wrong construction upon her action, and as he never came to see her now, when should she have another chance of explaining matters to him? No, she would not go to Pearl. It was really asking too much. She could not give up this opportunity, even for her cousin, for whom her affection was so great. But the moment that Amy arrived at this determination, and as she read the note again, she realized that this was no childish whim on Pearl's part, that her presence, for some reason unknown, was necessary to her cousin, and such being the case, her own wishes, her own inclinations must certainly be ignored. There was a suspicion of tears in her eyes, as, putting the note into her pocket, she rose from the table and looked across at her aunt. Auntie, she said, I'm sorry, but I can't go to the ball tonight. You and uncle must go without me. What's this nonsense? growled Mr. Rawlinson. What business have your aunt and I skipping about at balls? We are both too old to make fools of ourselves. Our object in going is simply to look after you, and if you choose to take a ridiculous whim into your head to stay at home, why, we stay at home too, that's all. And with a look on his face that expressed, nothing in heaven or earth will tear me hence, Mr. Rawlinson settled himself by the fire and deliberately lit a cigar. I'm dreadfully sorry to have give it up, replied Amy as she went towards the door. But Pearl wants me, she writes, very pressingly, and though she says she's not ill, I feel I must go. How tiresome of Pearl, exclaimed Mrs. Rawlinson, and yet, though I have no doubt your disappointment is very great, my dear, I think you are right to go to her. 
She seemed strangely unlike herself this afternoon when I was there, and I came away with the impression that she had something on her mind. If that's the case, I should have thought the best person to help her would be myself. But I certainly have no intention of being huffy with the poor child. Life is too short for such silliness. Go and cheer her up, Amy, and if you are not back by eleven, I shall know that you are spending the night there and will give orders that the maid is to take over your things. Good night, my dear, she continued, embracing her knees. Take the carriage and send it back for me. Your uncle may stay at home smoking his horrid old cigar if he likes but I, for one, certainly intend going to the ball. I should never look the dear Marquis and Marchioness in the face again if no member of the family were to put in an appearance tonight. There are occasions when it is absolutely necessary to sacrifice one's self on the altar of duty. This is one of them. Amy exchanged a sly glance with Mr. Rawlinson as she left the room. They both knew Rosina. As she entered Mrs. Nugent's drawing room, Amy, glancing at the clock, noticed that it marked exactly half past nine. Three quarters of an hour had therefore elapsed since she had first received the note summoning her. Am I in time? she inquired breathlessly as she went towards her cousin. She did not know why she asked such a question, unless it was that the expectant look on Pearl's face seemed to call for it. Pearl was standing near the grand piano. She looked as if she had just risen from it and her hand was pressed against her heart. Her tall figure was draped in a tea gown of white chiffon and of silver embroidery, and her face, framed in its masses of open hair, was almost as colourless as the gown. The grey eyes were the only features that moved in this countenance that seemed carved in stone. They were restless and sorrowful, almost despairing, and Amy stopped short in her approach as their glance fell upon her. Pearl, perceiving the look of frightened astonishment, turned away and said in a low voice, I thought, I thought when I heard the bell that it was, that it was someone else. But of course I at once remembered, Amy dear, that I had sent for you. It is good of you, very good of you to give up the ball and to come to me. Amy went up to her cousin and put her arms around her. Of course I came, she said. You wrote that you were in need of me, and I see you are right. What is it, darling? Whom were you expecting when you heard the bell? Amy, Pearl said excitedly, clasping her tighter to her. Promise me that you will stay by me, close by me all the time, with your arms about me, as they are now. They are so strong. These arms of yours, I feel so safe with them around me, and with your honest eyes looking at me, Amy. You will stay and sleep with me tonight, will you not? You will not leave me a minute until, 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 she hesitated. No, Pearl, I will not leave you, answered Amy. Of course I will stay the night, if you wish it. Come, let us sit on the sofa. I will keep my arms around you and you shall tell me how I can help you. Come, darling, lay your head on my shoulder. So, and then tell me what is distressing you. What do you fear? No, no, Amy, I cannot. I dare not tell you. But you will see, you will understand shortly, very shortly, in a minute, Two minutes. You will know, and then you will want to leave me. But you will not. You must not, Amy. Promise me you will not leave me. Whatever you may see, whatever you may hear, promise me you will stay tonight. 
Calm yourself, Pearl. I have already promised. Have I not come to be near you? Hark! There is the bell. The two women rose instinctively to their feet, with their arms around each other's waists, their eyes fixed upon the door. Amy had caught Pearl's excitement. She felt as if her nerves were strung on wires while waiting for the door to open. Her sense of hearing seemed intensified, as first she heard the front door open and close, then the slight sounds connected with an arrival, and lastly, the Japanese boy's shuffling gait, followed by the quick, firm footsteps of a man. It seemed a century to both women before the door finally opened. At length, however, the handle turned, and Lord Martinworth stood upon the threshold. He took one step forward, in his eyes was a glad light, and round his lips a smile. But he ventured no further into the room. His face changed as if by magic, he seemed rooted to the spot. His eyes resting on the two women with their terrified faces clasping each other's arms. Perfect silence reigned in the room as the three stood motionless, staring into each other's eyes. Amy, half supporting Pearl, felt her form quivering in her arms, and observing the pallor of her face, feared she was about to lose consciousness. She led her cousin to the sofa, then went towards Martinworth. Pardon me, Lord Martinworth, she said, bowing slightly. I see my cousin is not in a fit state to go through the form of introduction. I am Miss Mendovi, and I know who you are, for you were pointed out to me at the garden party. My cousin is not well, and she, she sent for me. I had just arrived when you came. Will, will you not sit down? It was in a state of desperation that Amy made this commonplace request. If she had followed her inclinations, she would have shrieked aloud. For God's sake, go! Don't you understand that every moment you are standing here is torture to this woman? But Lord Martinworth did not seem to hear either the request of all the words that preceded it. He remained motionless, like one paralyzed, staring at Pearl, who, with ashen face and closed eyes, was lying back on the sofa in a state of a semi-collapse. In that moment, he realized to the full all that she had experienced before and since she had sent him the letter of summons. For the first time in his life, he understood through what a deadly conflict must pass a woman who by nature is virtuous and chaste, before she casts honour and purity and self-respect to the winds. Strange to say, he forgot himself, his own bitter humiliation and disappointment. He forgot the rapture he had felt on receiving her summons, and the despair and rage that had taken its place when his eyes first alighted on the shrinking form sheltered in the girl's arms. He forgot all the varied, conflicting emotions that had taken possession of him since his entrance into Pearl's drawing room, and as his eyes remained fixed on the shame-stricken woman before him, he found himself thinking only of her. Once before, in this same room, when he had watched her weeping on that same sofa, he had partially divined what suffering this woman whom he loved and for whom at that moment he would gladly have given his life was undergoing. But it was only now, seeing her before him almost senseless with grief and shame, that the full magnitude of the torture she was enduring flashed upon him. He watched her there, breathing hard, without a trace of colour in her cheeks, and with her hands pressed against her heart, and his whole being went out in pity to her. And mingled with the pity was a feeling of admiration 
almost of veneration. He realized to the full that the hesitation, the faltering weakness had reached a climax, that her better self had conquered, and though crushed for the moment, he saw her rising triumphant from the struggle, a nobler and a stronger woman. How long he stood there, watching that shrinking form, troubled, turbulent thoughts, following each other in quick rapidity through his brain, Martin Worth never knew. He did not feel the girl's antagonistic yet inquiring eyes upon him. Indeed, he was indifferent to, almost unconscious of her presence. He knew that he was bidding adieu, an eternal adieu, to this the only love of his life. He felt none of the bitterness or unreasonable anger that had assailed him when Pearl, with such determination, left him three years before. For judging now by his own sentiments, he knew that what she had then written was indeed the truth, that in her renunciation of him, she had sacrificed herself and her love for his sake. But he would show her that he also could be prompt in the spirit of self-sacrifice. He would prove his love by leaving her, and she would thus learn and appreciate that. Erring man though he was, he could also renounce, he also could be strong. Yes, he would bid adieu to her now. The love, the passion of years, would, he knew well, remain with him till the grave. But he swore to himself, never again by word or by action would he raise that look of agony and of shame upon Pearl Nugent's face. He took a step towards her, and kneeling beside her sofa, he lifted the hand hanging listlessly down and pressed it between his own. Goodbye, he said. I'm leaving you, dear. You have conquered once again, Pearl. You have always conquered. The struggle has been very great, harder than ever this time, but once more you have chosen the right. You would always do right in the end. So, loving you as much as I venerate you, Pearl, I leave you, dear. From me, you have nothing more to fear. I ask your forgiveness for the suffering I have caused you. And raising to his lips the hand which he still held, he kissed it once, twice, and waiting for no reply, looking neither to the right nor to the left, Lord Martinworth walked towards the door. Pearl Nugent half rose on her sofa. She watched with wide open, miserable eyes, then let him go without a word. The hall door closed. For a long time, neither of the women spoke. Amy glanced once more at the clock and noticed that it wanted ten minutes to ten. Lord Martinworth had been in the room seven or eight minutes, and during that time, Pearl had not once opened her lips. It was nevertheless Mrs. Nugent who, arousing herself, broke the silence. You know now, Amy, why I wanted you, she said in a low, weak voice. I thank God that you came, for you have saved me. You must not hate me, dear. I have been a very foolish, a very wicked woman. Perhaps I ought not to have sent for you, a girl, and yet, and yet, you have saved me, Amy. My dear Pearl, replied Amy, smiling through her tears. Don't get tragic, for goodness sake. We surely have had enough of that kind of thing. And it's nonsense about my having saved you, whatever you may mean by that. Of one thing I'm certain, that my presence in your house this evening in no wise affected Lord Martinworth's conduct. He would have acted in precisely the same manner if I had not been here. The man is a gentleman. Anyone can see that. Don't make any confidences, dear, she added, as Pearl was about to speak. You are just in the mood to tell me all your secrets, and, believe me, you will only regret it later. 
So I will be magnanimous and will refrain from asking you questions. Besides, you know, I'm not a fool. I can guess a good deal, so my magnanimity is not so very tremendous after all. Now, dear, don't let us talk any more. But I will sing you something while you lay back and shut your eyes. Amy strolled towards the piano and placing her hands on the keys, watched Pearl from under her long eyelashes. Neither her soothing presence nor the sweetest lullaby she could think of seemed, however, at first to have much effect upon her cousin's excited nerves. Pearl walked restlessly up and down the room, trailing her white dress behind her with sad eyes shining feverishly from out the still whiter face, looking like a troubled spirit from another world. For some time, she continued pacing the room. Then, as if struck with a sudden idea, she unlocked a drawer of her writing table extracted from some hidden recess Martin Wood's reply to her letter. Read it deliberately through, tore it into a hundred pieces and cast it into the flames. She watched it burn until nothing but the blackened ashes remained. At length, with a sigh of exhaustion, she stretched herself once more on the sofa and ere long Amy had the satisfaction of perceiving the eyelids droop and the weary and worn out pearl fall into a dreamless slumber. Amy continued playing low strains of music for some time longer. Then she rose noiselessly and seated herself near Pearl. For over an hour, Amy sat silent and motionless, watching the sorrowful and beautiful face, on the cheeks of which traces of tears still remained. And as she watched, hardly daring to breathe, for fear of rousing the sleeper, her thoughts dwelt on many matters connected with Pearl. The full details of the divorce had been studiously kept from her, but Amy would not have been a modern young lady if she had not been acquainted with a good deal more than her elders gave her the credit of knowing. She was perfectly aware that Pearl had run away from some man who had been mixed up in her case and who had wanted to marry her and though she had never heard his name, by the simple process of putting two and two together, it was not difficult to divine that the man concerned was Lord Martinworth. How he adores her, thought Amy, what a pity she did not marry him, instead of throwing him into the clutches of that awful woman. For with the harshness of youth, it was thus that Miss Mendovy designated Lord Martinworth's wife. Her imagination pictured that awful woman whirling in the giddy waltz with Sir Ralph Nicholson while big tears of disappointment clouded her pretty eyes. She wondered if her act of self-sacrifice had been wasted or the reverse, but even as she debated this question in her own mind, she recalled once more the look of triumphant anticipation on Martinworth's face as he entered the room that evening contrasting so painfully with Pearl's expression of shame, her action of shrinking terror. The remembrance of these two faces at that portentous moment were imprinted vividly on her brain, and Amy knew that it was needless to doubt any longer. Her question was answered. <laughs>